right. All right. Well, I think uh, I've got about 3.30. Um, I want to go ahead and, and kick off the seminar series. Um, this is just starting in the spring of 2015, so this is our first time. And um, it's uh, hosted by the Department of Computer Science here at the College of So thank you all for coming. Uh, a few things that I want to do real quick before we head on. I want to give a big shout out to uh, to the gals here. Without them, I could have never done this. Uh, they helped me. Um, I guess I got to speak a little louder. They helped me set up the uh, the lodging and the travel and the uh, advertisement for this. So uh, I really appreciate them uh, helping out, and um, I just want to say thanks. <clears throat> okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to. Ed here, he's from the University of New Mexico, uh, computer graphics. Um, he's actually going to be talking about uh, WebGL and the HTML5, uh, those technologies. Uh, Ed, uh, he's been in this uh, area for a very long time. If you get a chance to talk to him after the presentation, he's got some great airline flight stories. I can personally vouch for those. Um, but anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Ed. And thank you, Ed. Okay, thanks. Am I supposed to talk to the mic? Uh, I guess. Uh, that may be. Yes, you are. You want to talk to the mic? Okay. Uh, okay, hi. Um, okay, uh, actually, I, I was here. Uh, uh, I don't recognize too many faces from then, but I was here uh, three years ago uh, giving a talk about uh, what we do in our lab. I while I was at UNM, which was for a long time, I, I started something called the Arts Lab, the Art Research, Technology, and Science Laboratory, which was this highly interdisciplinary center. Uh, it actually was primarily art, art, um, computer science, architecture, and you know, really everybody on campus was participating in that. That was part of why we went in, while New Mexico was building on this film industry, and we talked a lot about. But a lot of the work we did then, and I, I showed you, and if anybody's interested, I can show you some stuff later, uh, we, we worked a lot with multi-projector films. And, uh, you know, planetariums, we were doing all kinds of uh, visualization of art and in domes and a lot of real-time stuff. And, uh, I can show you some, which is funny, being in this island space. And, uh, you know, <laughs> domes, we saw as being a big competitor to, to IMAXs. And in fact, they in fact, they are. But, it, but what I'm going to talk about uh, today has to do uh, more with my uh, sort of history of, of teaching. Uh, I've had a, a graphics text that's been kind of the standard text for computer science departments. It's, it, it's in it, the, this new edition is the seventh edition, so it's probably been out for more than 15 years, something like that. Uh, and we've made some big changes, and I sort of want to explain some of the things that some of the decisions we make and how this impacts our students and our curriculum. Now, I, when I got here, I discovered that uh, uh, some of you actually took a course using WebGL. Or any of you here who did that? Okay, so somebody has done that. Uh, that's neither a hindrance or a help here, but uh, let, let's get started. So what I want to talk about is sort of how uh, things have evolved teaching computer graphics, and, and in particular, in, in my case, going OpenGL to, to WebGL. I want to show you some of the things that our students have done uh, as a result. I claim uh, that, that going to, the web, to a web-based uh, system has been an enormous advantage for, for our students and the kinds of work they have done. It's much better than anything they've ever done in all the years of teaching uh, the beginning of computer, uh, computer graphics. Course. So what, what I want to start with is, is this. I want to argue that uh, I first started teaching uh, computer graphics in, in, probably in the early 80s because I shot my mouth off once too often, which I have a tendency to do. But I, I was an image processing person. And if you're an image processing person and you work with pixels, you can easily convince yourself that computer graphics can't work. How could you do this when you only know how to manipulate all these pixels and you go to 3D? This is not possible. So I, uh, we had had an adjunct teaching course who would only come down for half a day a week and I said, this is terrible for our students, this is unfair, I can do better than that. And my, my friend who had preceded me as chair of 
computer science said, well, then do it. And so here I was teaching computer science, uh, teaching computer graphics, not knowing anything at all about it, and convinced it couldn't work. Uh, but it was, it's been an interesting experience, and I think a, a lot of things that I, that I thought best are things that I knew nothing about, and so I was trying to explain what I was learning to other people to bring it make sense to me. Uh, so, for, so if you go back to the history of, of what was taught in computer graphics, it turns out that, that starting in the 70s, when, when people started teaching computer graphics fairly routinely in computer science departments, the curriculum really hasn't been that much different. If you go back to, to books that precede human folly and man man and human sprout, you'll see all of these topics pretty much in those books. You, you talk about geometry, you talk about building models, you talk about, uh, about matrices and matrix transformations, you do some interaction, there's, there's always interactive uh, computer graphics, and then you get into the sort of the physics of light and materials interactive, so you talk about lighting and shading. And, and pretty soon, uh, people by the end of the 70s were starting to talk about, about texture mapping. And if you look at it, and I'll go flash by my, my syllabus in a, in a bit, it turns out the syllabus is, is basically the same after all the years. Now, you know, so here's, here's simple examples of things we do, I'll, I'll see a little bit of this. You know, you start with modeling something like a, like a cube and coloring it and there's a little interaction down, down there and then you talk about lighting and shading so that you can get that sort of more realistic view of it and then you add some texture on it. That's all pretty, pretty standard. Now, even though the curriculum was the same, was it really what people did in, in their classes? And, and the answer is sort of yes and no. On the theory side, we were always able to talk about these things. I mean, uh, these basic principles have been known uh, for quite a while in computer graphics. Really, uh, big developments were in the 60s and, and the 70s, but you had no way to really teach it because you did, just didn't have either the software or the hardware uh, that could do it. So if I look back now into my records and I said, well, what, you know, you were teaching this stuff, but what were your students actually doing in the projects? They're, they're pretty pathetic by today's standards. They would, they would draw lines by filling in all the, the pixels along between two points, or, or they, would, uh, they would learn to fill a, a triangle by one of many, many schemes. And that and so in a way, they were, they were kind of disappointed at the end of the course that you, you would sort of give them this idea of what was possible in computer graphics, but they weren't able to do anything but the most primitive, low-level uh, kinds of things. So, so the really is, yeah, the, the curriculum was there, but you really couldn't do what, what I think was exciting students. Because even in the, at that time, students were starting to see the first computer-generated movies that had these extraordinary effects in it, and, and we couldn't do it. So what really changed things to a large degree was that the hardware started getting there. But also we started getting actual standardized software. What people were using back uh, when I first started doing it is you basically you stuck writing your own software, which usually was pretty crappy and not very portable uh, and, and not able to do very much. But you started getting some standards. So uh, starting in the pretty much in the, I guess the mid '70s, uh, there were some standards groups that had been successful uh, with things like Algo and Fortran. And they said, "Well, we should have a standard graphics." Thing set up two groups, uh, one in Europe, one in North America. The Europeans developed something called the graphical kernel standard, and the North Americans developed something called the core standard, uh, which differed uh, between them in a great way. The, the GKS standard, in which I wrote a book that no one's ever heard of using because the standard binding never appeared. Uh, so I had some disasters along the way, personally. Uh, but it was uh, basically a 2D standard. And what was going on in the real world in terms of hardware was people who started to come out with the first three-dimensional, 3D hardware workstations in the, in the CAD community, uh, primarily the aerospace, military aerospace community, was very interested in that. And the first workstations we had that, that used the core standard, which was not as good in terms of, uh, of 
say, the computer science principles of how you develop a good standard, uh, but they put it in the first Sun workstation. So we had Sun 2 workstations. I uh, tricked our team into buying and, and we had the first ones in, in New Mexico. And they, they, were, they had some interesting properties, like the monitors were falling up all the time. We had very low humidity and static charge was building up in the, in the things that they called pool. Uh, but, but the core standard uh, was in there. It was 3D. I started teaching with it, the idea that you could use the standard software, which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. It was, uh, it was a bit flaky, so often when you try to fill a polygon, you would fill the entire screen with sort of the algorithm of escape and just <laughs> filling everything that could. Uh, so it was all right. But then in, in industry, where people were actually trying to do real things, uh, people developed for the workstation standard Things, which was the programmer's hierarchical interactive graphic system. And that, you know, it's kind of got everything you want in that name. And, and it, was, uh, it wasn't bad. It was very little hard to use, much more of a database kind of standard, how you, you build and share hierarchical models of graphics, graphics context. About the same time, X came along, and then people were, were able to then do at least raster graphics between uh, network terminals, graphics terminals, so that was nice. And then somebody said, well, why don't we connect the two and have both? So a standard came along for PEX, which was basically FIGS, for, FIGS extensions for X. Now, if you had two systems that were really a mess to use, and you combined them into one system, you got something that was totally unusable. And so I, I think I tried one semester to teach with PEX. It was just, just, a, just a disaster. But it's still out there. And, there's still versions out there that led to things like Vermal, which is a virtual reality markup language. Uh, people started being interested in sharing graphics with bigger, bigger things. But the thing that really changed things for me is um, in New Mexico uh, University, New Mexico is uh, the, the main, the only source of income in New Mexico, is where you've got a couple of big national labs there, principally Los Alamos and San Diego. And I had a bunch of students that were working uh, that were working for me as RAs out at uh, Sandia, and they had infinite money, and so they had all these really nice silicon graphics machines. And one of them, my master's students, said, "You know, I'm programming in this thing GL on the on, on the uh, SGI, and it's really nice. It's it's easy to program in, and it's really fast. And a version was about to come out called OpenGL." usable on other systems, and it got me kind of curious, and it turned out he, he was right. So let me talk about sort of our few minutes about the origin of this. Uh, so Iris GL, the original OpenGL, the predecessor of OpenGL, uh, was built uh, for the SGI uh, geometry engine. The SGI geometry engine was the first VLSI implementation of the graphics pipeline. And as such, it was not only really fast, really uh, cost of the SGI workstations cost way less than anything else uh, that, that was out there. And it so the Iris GL had to have everything in it. So they had to have some kind of inter API for, for users. And because it was running only in this kind of machine, it had to have all the windowing stuff. It had to have some way of using interactive devices. And all of that was built in the, in the, in the Iris uh, GL. And it was still, it was, very, it was so it had the combination of being close enough to the hardware to be, to be efficient, but it was at a high enough level that it was fairly easy to program from an application algorithm's point of view. Well, at some point they decided, uh, let's make that open and create something called OpenGL. Now, the problem there was that uh, all the windowing stuff and the input stuff was different on every architecture you do. So they, decided, well, let's make OpenGL only concerned with ranking. How do you define a bunch of geometry and then have that geometry rendered, rendered to the screen? Okay? And then you figure out how to add on all the input and the stuff in your, own, uh, your own system. Now, the way that was done is, is that, that people created a couple of uh, architecture-specific libraries. XGL was the glue that would connect OpenGL to an X-based system, 
So you would use X for the window and the, and the uh, input, and then you would use all the, all the geometry for the geometry rendering. Similarly, WGL for windows and AP, APL for AGL for, for Apple uh, products. Well, later people developed a couple of libraries that you would recompile for each system. So the API would be the same regardless of where you were. And I think any of you that did OpenGL courses before used something like Flood or FreeBlood or Blue, which were libraries that, that enabled you if you could get the, the right version of the library and, and on your system, all the OpenGL code would be the same as it had to be and the input with it. Now, very quickly, I want to spend just a couple of minutes just going through sort of the evolution of OpenGL over, over 20 years uh, to, to, to sort of get to where we are now. Uh, when OpenGL first came out 20 years ago, it was this pipeline kind of idea where the idea is you start on the left with, uh, with defining your geometry in terms of points or vertices, and you manipulate them through transformations of matrices. And that's the geometry side of processing, and on the right side you see all the pixel processing, where you, it's called fragment processing because you have, you generate things called potential pixels. You don't know yet, quite yet, if they're going to appear on, on the display, but they could be. So a fragment you think of as a, as a potential pixel. And that, and that is, a, is a totally different kind of processing because you're processing bits there. On the left side, you're processing geometric entities in floating point, and this is what the uh, geometry engine really is the architecture of the geometry engine. In the middle, there's this rasterization step which converts the geometry into the fragments. Okay? And that's basically still to this day fixed. You don't have much control. So in the original versions of, of, of OpenGL, uh, everything was fixed. All the functions in, in the API were fixed. You didn't really get to play with, with anything in here. You got to change your it's called a fixed function pipeline. But beginning with the second major iteration, uh, people were coming out with graphics processing units that allowed you to, to actually program if you wanted to, didn't have to. But you could program what, what would happen either on the geometry end or on the, on the bit fragment or pixel, uh, pixel end through little programs that were called shaders. The, his, the reason they're called shaders is sort of historical. Cool. But you still have, but still most people, and certainly almost all the courses that people taught, were still being done with the fixed function type. But what happened is, as things developed, the people who were doing the developers, and doing the development, and doing the standards, uh, said, "Wait a minute, this is we're, it's, everything was always going to be backward compatible." Part of this was that um, the, the major community using OpenGL was primarily the scientific where stability is really important. You want to be able to, you spend all this time writing this program, and you go to the, the next version of the software, you want to be sure that that program is going to work. And so you, this is in con very strong contrast to the whole development side uh, with DirectX and, and Microsoft. They didn't care. They put out a new version of DirectX, and you'd have to do everything all over again. And the scientific community was very much a, into this. So you always had backward compatibility. But over the years, it got to be more and more difficult because you were supporting all of this old functionality that made the drivers enormous. And we used to think that when you still first start studying computer science, you take a course and you write a little driver, you know, it's this tiny little thing. And we're talking about many, many megabytes of, of driver for this thing. These drivers were getting huge, and the driver writers were going, So they announced with version 3 that 3.1 would just deprecate, which is a nice way of saying throw out, uh, all of these old fixed functions and have, have everything based on shaders. Because what was happening was that, let me go back now, that what you could do in the shaders on each end was incredible. The programs, they were becoming fast, they were programmable, they had a lot of memory associated with them. And so the power was shifting to allow you to do almost anything within, within shaders. 
So they said, okay, we're just going to say that starting with 3.1, uh, we're throwing out uh, the fixed function pipeline and all of those functionality, and you must write your own changes. So at first it sounded pretty bad for the people teaching. Oh, what? I can't, I can't use my own, you know, this is my editor's reaction. You can't do this. You're going to force everybody to change their curriculum. Yeah, but this is what's, what's happening. Now, since then, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, they added new types of shaders, uh, uh, geometry shaders, tessellation shaders to help you uh, build uh, meshes, uh, compute shaders so you can like have a floating point processor extra. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm just going to talk about this basic uh, uh, model, which says that, okay, here's, here's a simplified model of what the pipeline looks like. Now. So you have vertex processing, that's your geometry. You have a rasterizer you can't change. You have a fragment processor, and you have a program called the Vertex Shader, which is you must write that. So that was the big change. You have to write that program. And it could be very simple. If your vertices are not doing much, and you're not transforming them, you're just sending them on. Same thing with Fragment Shader. It can be simple as saying, oh, I want to color everything red. But the idea is it's giving you the potential to do far, far more by writing programs in what's called the old GL shading language. Do that, which is a very C-like -like language with some extra uh, types to it. So this is the model that we, we adopted for the uh, sixth edition of my book. And it forced a lot of people to change their, their curriculum, but uh, what you were able to do was pretty nice. Uh, now, the other things were going on. And, and the main other thing that was going on was what was happening in the web -based world. And so there was a big, there was a demand a while ago the web really took over for people to have embedded graphics inside of other systems. So you may be building a box that has some job, and you want it to do a little graphics. So you want to be able to put in something small that doesn't consume much power that just produces some simple graphics. So they came out with a version, uh, two versions actually, uh, of a system called OpenGL ES, which ES stands for Embedded Systems. And that was a simpler version of OpenGL. But the second version of it, uh, ES 2.0, was based on, on OpenGL 3, and therefore you had to provide your own changes. So it really was modern, but it didn't have all the bells and whistles that the latest versions of OpenGL have, and most people don't need. Now, at the same time, everybody was interested in, hey, the web. We want to run in our browser. We don't want to have to recompile code. We want to be able to trade code. I want to be able to click on your URL and see your, your graphics run on my system. I want to bring the source code over and change the architecture and worry about that. Now, I'll tell you, somebody who writes books for this, this was terrible, great for me, because what was terrible was the beginning of every semester, I'd be deluged of people using the book all over the place who were gone. Oh, I have this version of Windows. Oh, I have this version of Linux. And the libraries don't work here. And what are the libraries called in this Linux? And I'm going, I had no way to answer this stuff. It was getting uglier and uglier. And I was just getting killed by this. I wanted something that was really the same for everybody. So WebGL came along. And what it is is a JavaScript implementation of OpenGL ES2. So it says you have to write a, a vertex shader, you have to write a fragment shader, you have to have an application, and you have to write them in JavaScript, okay, which we'll, we'll talk, about, uh, talk about here. I think this is a much friendlier JavaScript place than when I was at Clemson yesterday. Uh, they were very anti-JavaScript up there. Uh, and, but the thing is that every, so the, the reason though is that every browser that runs HTML uh, will run JavaScript automatically. It's there. So if you write things in JavaScript, there's no system dependencies in it. It all goes away. And in addition, the code then runs locally. So if you click on somebody's URL with a WebGL program, what is the browser going to do? The browser is going to bring that program over and run it on your system. So I run pretty much, I can go on my cell phone, I can go just click on any of my sites at UNM my sample code, and it's going to run on the cell phone. I mean, that's, that's an incredible advance in, in teaching and, 
and how people will enjoy uh, what they do and be able to show it to, to their friends. So here's why I, here's a sort of a summary of why uh, we like doing this. We gave this presentation last summer at SIGGRAPH. So it's cross-platform in, in the very best way, and that includes not just computers, but essentially all the new cell phones are on it. Finally, Apple has released it in, in, in the iPhone, so any Android or recent iPhone will run, uh, will run all of these applications. The low barrier to entry is, I'm going to claim, it's much simpler to get started uh, with this. It, since you're working with interpreted code, you can sit there in, in an editor. It's all you really need is an editor. And you can sit there and, and change things essentially instantly and watch, watch what happens. Also, the, the development environments in some of these browsers are getting pretty good. There's infinite tools out there. And I, I, you know, one of the things I found teaching is the first time is I didn't know about these tools with my students on it. And they're very used to using tools on, on the web. So they were just picking up stuff and adding it to their graphics without any, any problem. The performance issue is when you're teaching, it's almost a non-issue. In real applications, it's almost a non-issue too. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of those. And it works with pretty much every other web API that's out there. Because HTML5, anything that runs in HTML5, HTML5, you can combine all these things together very easily. Now, the argument against it, and this is what I got, I, I get two different reactions. I, I work with a lot of people in Santa Fe in, a, in more working in a sort of development world, uh, doing all kinds of really neat stuff, but not academic. And they just love running, working with JavaScript and uh, showing some of their stuff at, at, at the end. But on the academic side, uh, CS departments, academics pretty much hate JavaScript. So I had to sort of deal with, with, with that problem. Is that, uh, uh, and from the students' point of view, never was an issue. You tell them that they don't, we don't teach JavaScript, very few places teach JavaScript at all. To our students, it's just another language. They've seen a bunch, okay, I'll do this one if you tell them to. That proved to be no problem. People would complain, oh yeah, but the code's visible there. You click on the URL, how do students submit things? They send me the URL in an email. They go, oh, yeah, everybody can see it. It wasn't an issue. We didn't have any problems. We didn't have any time. In terms of startup, because you do have to do a few things a little bit differently, uh, the, the basic result was that a little more time to do the first, the first assignment. I went through a course and I did what I had, the, the assignments I had done before just so I could you know, compare. Uh, after that, Everybody was just zooming along the first assignment. So uh, here's a couple of things we did. The latest version of my book uh, is, is in uh, uses WebGL. Uh, there's a very interesting course Eric Haynes uh, put together for Udacity that uses 3JS, which is a, a very powerful scene graph built on top of, of, of WebGL. So you don't see the WebGL directly, but you're in fact running WebGL. And it's, uh, if you're really into scene graphs and modeling, 3JS has gotten very, very uh, popular. We've given some courses in scene graph lately uh, about this, this stuff. But there's a lot of users out there who are doing it. The, uh, so some of the examples are uh, uh, Google Google Maps is now uh, is now WebGL. They just rewrote the whole thing uh, to do that. The, the Unity game engine is available in, in WebGL. Her Doom is 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 as a WebGL. Uh, some of the stuff I saw in SIGGRAPH last summer was just astounding. So it, it's real. It's not just a, a thing we use to, to get started. Uh, people are realizing that the power of being able to work in the web just makes up for any of these little performance uh, issues. Uh, I start from the beginning. Uh, my, my friend Patrick Cozy at Penn uh, does the second course using WebGL. I think he, he's realized he should have done the first course. So what are the so what are the differences, and then I'll show you very quickly some of the things my students do as, as sort of the standard assignments. Well, so the necessary new elements if you were teaching um, with with standard desktop OpenGL using using C is oh yeah you got to switch to JavaScript. Uh, you may have to teach a little bit of HTML, but I, I think most students have seen it. The 
little HTML that you need. It takes you 15 minutes, half an hour to download it. You need to know. You need to know a little bit about how execution in a browser is a little bit different than execution of just running a C program or running a desktop open GL program or a C. It's minor, but I think you need to talk a little bit about that. One of the joys of this is that interactivity comes back. And one of the things that's happened in, in the recent versions of desktop open GL is if you really are doing what's called a core profile, running a pure None of the old fixed functions were running in a pure way. None of the interactive stuff was in Bloodworks. It's, well, it's not none, almost all. Uh, you can't use menus anymore. You can't use fonts anymore. Uh, you can, I'm not sure you can use a mouse to do anything because of the function deprecation. In WebGL, because of JavaScript and HTML, it is almost trivial to bring back all these devices. I have a slide in here that shows you. Basically, you want a mouse, uh, if you want mouse input, two lines. If you want a button input, two lines. One in the HTML file, one in the JavaScript file. You need a menu, two lines. So, so interactive computer graphics, the way most people were teaching it, was just becoming computer graphics because the interactivity was getting almost impossible to do. One of my claims is you get it all back using these web packages that the students were familiar with, uh, they were able to do some wonderful things. So I taught um, the course first time this way last spring. Uh, there's my syllabus, but it, it just scanned it. It, it, it. With one or two exceptions, it really isn't much different than anything I did 30 years ago uh, teaching this stuff. Uh, now I do a lot more different discrete techniques. and I, I like to do a lot of off-screen Except for that, it's, it's the same basic topics. This is the, the first course. Okay, so a couple of basic things that the way I do things is, uh, I don't know how Brent did, how you did, did this one. You taught it. I decided I didn't want to use any other packages like CSS or, or jQuery for input. I just wanted to have pure HTML and, and JavaScript, nothing else in the, first, in the first course. If the students knew either of any other packages, welcome to bring it in, but I didn't want to spend any time in class uh, talking about it. So what, the way we sort of did things was, even though you could do everything in one HTML file, uh, the way I did things is I, I would have, for every application, two files. An HTML file that would include the shaders and describe what we wanted the page to look like, where did the canvas go, where did the interactive devices go, and bring in any utility files you needed. And the JavaScript file would be purely the graphics part. It would be the action of the thing. So it would look very much like what you would see uh, in a desktop version. And I think that worked really well. Now, a couple of the JavaScript issues. Uh, that these are the ones. How many of you have not done any JavaScript? Oh, you all have. So I don't have to say anything. Okay, but real quick. I mean, one of the things people had to get used to are first that there's only three numeric types. Only three types, only one numeric type. And people, you know, first that bothers them. Then all of a sudden they see, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, all my loops work, everything's working. Uh, so that turned out to, to not be an issue. The, the more ish, big issue is to, to really understanding that everything is an object and that objects inherit in this prototype a prototypical matter, which is different from how they would generally learn things came up the, the, the Java route or the C++ route. And that takes a while to get, uh, to get used to. I think now, at this point, I prefer this and, and, and I kind of like this. But you know, weird things happen. I used to have a list of what I called the JavaScript gotchas. There would be these things that, that would get you and you'd be sitting there staring at it and then you'd find a, an expert and you said, oh, that's because you don't understand the inheritance of JavaScript. And also, it's a large language, so there's uh, uh, many ways to do things, especially when you're working with objects and, and models. And there's some sort of ones that are better than others. I don't know how many. How many of you know of Crockett's book, JavaScript the Good Parts? It's a, it's a neat book. Almost everybody who, who does JavaScript at a high level recommends that book highly. 
because he says, look, all that is, there are these other ways of doing things in the language, but they're really terrible ways to do it. Here's the ways you shouldn't be doing it. So, so that was what. The scoping issues are different than sometimes in the gotchas in there. But, you know, students, students got over it faster than I did. Right now. So, uh, the, the big one here, I think, and this is worth spending a few minutes on, is the issue of arrays. That JavaScript arrays are not the same as, as C++ style, Java style arrays. And that's a, a huge issue in, in WebGL. Uh, since everything is an object, the JavaScript array is an object and it inherits a bunch of methods, which as I'll show you in a minute, can be very useful. So you get push and pop for free automatically. You get the length of variables is in there. But what happens is that when you try to pass things over to the to WebGL side, WebGL is OpenGL and yes. It, it, does, it expects data to come over to it just like it did in C. You get a very simple string of floats coming over and that's, but instead it's getting this object if you're sending over JavaScript. So there's a couple of ways of, of, of getting around this. One is to use a, a JavaScript type arrays. Did you do that in the uh, class? Did you use type arrays? Um, no. Just, no. Just and and, and I, I decided not to, too. But they act like C. They act like C arrays. And if you, you, you get to define a say a new flow 32 array and then it, it becomes that. But I want to show you the JavaScript are really neat uh, uh, to use. So here's, here's a, a really simple example we had before. Here's just building up a cube from, the, from, you know, from an index model. Uh, so here's a cube, number of the indices, and you say, okay, the cube is six, is six quads, and each quad is, is going to be implemented as two, as two triangles. So this function on the left to define uh, the, the, the color cube in terms of quads is essentially identical to any C program. Nothing much different there, so that's good. Uh, but here's the here's the JavaScript array uh, arrays for defining some colors and and, and the, the geometric locations of the vertices. So this is a two-dimensional array. It kind of looks, in some ways, what you could do in C using curly brackets, but it's not the same thing, and that's where you uh, can get in, into trouble. This is a JavaScript. But here's the advantage of doing that. If I want to now go through that and build up this triangle, so, uh, excuse me, build up this cube. So this cube's got six faces. Each face, each face is two triangles. Each triangle is three vertices. I'm going to build up uh, a single array that has all of the geometry data all lined up and another one that has all the colors. And I'm going to pass those on to the, to the shaders, get it into the GP. Well, look at this code that does it for quad. This is doing it using just two triangles in a brute force way. It's obviously a little nicer if you use, uh, if you use triangle, uh, triangle strips or triangle uh, loops. But that's, but that, you know, it, it, it works, you know, it, the one line gets changed. So it's just saying, look, here's a function. You give it the four indices. It forms two triangles. And here it's using the length variable and the push to do it. Now, my claim is, that from a student perspective or my perspective of developing code, that is so much easier to look at and see if that's what's doing. The loops that you usually have have gone away. It's just a really nice, nice way to be teaching and to, and to be developing code. One of the things when I, when I was first doing this and working with my group of JavaScript nuts I worked with, uh, I, I was real proud of this one example I had done and I sent it over to them and they said, that's terrible. You're writing C in JavaScript. You're not supposed to do that. And so I started learning my lesson and started doing more things, things like this. So it's very, I claim it's very, very nice. A uh, couple of things of what you have to do is, uh, basically this is just showing you, you open up a, a, a canvas, which you can specify in the HTML file like this. It's just saying I want the canvas to be 512 by 512 in this side. That's kind and then you, on the top, that's all you have to do in the, uh, in the JavaScript file is just say, okay, that's. So this is the you know equivalent of opening a window. It's, it's, it's pretty trivial. Uh, if you look down here, and I just wanted to show this one little part. Here, here's the part of, of if, if you 
taken any of whether you've done this in WebGL or desktop GL. Uh, it's the same thing, how you set up uh, uh, the buffers to get sent over. And here's the only difference is that this flatten function we created. This is what I've decided is, is a much better path than trying to use typed arrays. Just create a tiny little function which we give out to everybody uh, that just takes a JavaScript array and strips out the data and makes it into a C-like array, type array, and sends it over to the WebGL side, to the OpenGL WebGL side. That's all you need to do. You do this with matrices, you go flatten the matrix. The matrix is, is a JavaScript uh, object. So this is the thing that connects the two parts. And everything else in there should look pretty, pretty much like any other OpenGL program. You clear the screen, you, when you render, you clear the screen, you draw your triangles, and, and uh, the request animation frame is equivalent to just swapping, swapping buffers. So the, 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 the OpenGL side is, is pretty much what it's always been. So let me show you some of the things we've done. Oh, one other thing we've done is, uh, you know, a lot of those functions that were in the old OpenGL, the matrix functions, the translate, rotate, the viewing functions, perspective, ortho, they were really nice to have around. The reason that they got deprecated was that they were not very efficient because they were doing everything with the CPU instead of the GPU, and, and so they were thrown out. So what we said is, let's, if people want to use those functions, instead of having our, our students rewrite the same code over and over and over again, what we would do is give them those functions in, in a library called MDJS on my website. Uh, and all they, they do is form the matrices. And you can do whatever you want with it. So if you want a translation matrix, you just go translate the parameters. And then you do what you want with that matrix. And you can send it over to the GPU and multiply it with something else. So all those functions are in there. We also put in all the GLSL types into this library. Now, there's a good reason for that in terms of, of learning computer graphics. When you get up to talking about things like uh, like shading and lighting, you find that when you, where you do it can be, it's up to you. You can do shading and lighting in the CPU. You can do shading and lighting in the vertex shader. And you can do shading and lighting in the, in the fragment shader. So if you have these types, the code looks essentially identical. So we can ask students to say, OK, compare shading done these different ways. And all they really have to do, almost with just maybe a line or two added or changed, is just move the code from the CPU, from the application code to the shader to another type of shader. And it works out wonderfully. And so we added those things into that, into that package. Input again, this is just showing you that a, that a button takes one line in the HTML file to give it a, a place to put it in a, in a name, and one, two lines in the, uh, in the JavaScript file, which just say get the identifier of it, and every time it's clicked, do the following. That's it. And one below it is a slider. You give it a min and a maximum value, your, your sort of your minimum step you want it uh, to count, and now you have a slider. I've never seen anything easy. So you don't need packages like jQuery, unless you want nicer looking buttons and sliders, sure. But to get started and do this stuff, it's really easy. Okay, so now let me talk about my, you know, my experience. With, these are the projects I've sort of given periodically for, for many, many years. One of them is, the first one I give to get them started often is, is what's called twist. Twist is where you rotate, but the amount you rotate depends how far you are from the origin. So here's on the, on the top left is, is an equilateral triangle centered at the origin. Well, if you just have three vertices and you simply rotate those vertices, then you get what's on the bottom left because you, you don't have any of the intermediate points being processed. So you say, well, what happens if you tessellate that triangle? So you give students in the first assignment a chance to learn a little bit about tessellation, and they can do it very nicely in reverse some nice little recursive programs to tessellate a triangle. And then we say, now you're modeling one triangle with lots of triangles. Now what happens when the amount of rotation depends on the distance from the origin? And they get things that look like on the bottom right. You can have a lot of fun with that, trying different shapes and different amounts of 
rotation in there. And so it's a very good project for them to get started. Uh, you know, it's a standard first project. It took them a little bit longer just because we were switching the JavaScript and that. But after that, things really took off. Here's the sort of the standard. Uh, uh, actually, this is a little harder problem than I, than I usually give. I asked them in the second project, which is probably about seven, six, seven weeks, six weeks into the semester, to do a little CAD program where they had to be able to take the basic shapes, uh, bring them into the canvas, move them around, change their size and their orientation. At this point, they hadn't done any lighting and shading. So to make them look 3D, they had to render them twice, once with lines and once with, with, with solids. And with, with. That was nice. And, and, these, and also it got all that interactivity just came right back in, sliders and things. They had no problems with all of this, with, uh, with this project. The third one, the third one I, I give, and I give this one, I, I love giving this one, this is a funny example, uh, is I give them, have them do a 3D maze. So the first thing they have to do is, well, it's a 2D maze, they want to do a 3D maze. Uh, but they have to look at it in 3D. So the first thing they have to do is figure out an algorithm that will generate a maze, and then I don't ask them to automatically go through it, I ask them just to uh, uh, be able to give me controls and let them do that. So let's see if I guess this is going to work. Okay. So here's one. Now most of them, what they do, they've done lighting and shading at this point. So, they're, so most of them, the view is that you're inside the maze and you're looking in perspective down this tube and you got and you can get lost in a very low order maze. It's just amazing. But this guy, I, I use for demos because uh, he also gave me a top view so you, I don't get lost. And so here, you know, you can move, you can move around and, and do this and, and so on. So that was a, that was, they had no, this, this is a good, it's a really good test on transformations and, and being able to concatenate transformations together. Uh, they did, again, they did fine on this one. Then, uh, then in the uh, second half of the course, I, I give them, they have to come up with their own projects. And I'll just show you one or two of those. Uh, they have to come up with their own term projects. And here's where they really show me. I mean, this was, uh, this one is, this, this kid built uh, a CG, CSG modeler. So in CSG model, it's a solid modeler, but you, you're rendering everything in polygons, so you have the standard set operations where you can intersect two objects, take the union of two objects, you can subtract one object from the other. And this thing works wonderfully. I mean, it's, he hears his objects and he has all the, the basic set operations and, you can, and it works beautifully. I mean, that's you know, first course of computer graphics. I thought that was pretty good. But here's my favorite here, and I'll, and I'll actually run this one for you. This, this, this kid did a Voronoi diagram. So how, how many of you know what a Voronoi diagram is? Okay, you don't care. <laughs> so, oh, what happened here? Did they just kick me off? Yeah, just go to the guess again. Just do guess again. Yeah, the underneath the button too. All right, bring me back. Okay, yeah, back. Okay, so what he did is, so the idea is you have these seed points that are kind of where the shininess is in there, and you're coloring things based on the closest other points. So it's something you study often in your algorithms or senior study in an algorithms class. And this was so what he did here. Let me see if I get this going. If I really back on. Yes, I am. The, the C points are moving. And he's computing a new Voronoi diagram every iteration. And he's doing it in the GPU. That's the important thing. He figured, gee, this GPU is fast. Why? And I'm going to do my standard computer science in the GPU. And I go, this kid got it. The graphics here is pretty simple, although he did some clever things to make this look 3D when it's not really 3D. But he understood that this GPU is a powerful processor and that you can write code for it that is really, really nice. And this is something that he learned in one of his other classes. So I, I thought this one was, uh, was just great. And I love it. It's a beautiful display. <laughs> so, with that being said, 
Uh, let me show you, do you have a couple more minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'll show you a couple other things. Um, my friends, Ruth, Ruth Chubay and Bruce Sherwood, uh, are retired physicists. They were last at NC State. Uh, they have a book called, it's not called Matter and Energy, it's called Matter and Interaction, which is in its fourth edition, which they claim is the only 21st century physics textbook that's used in some of the best schools. And the reason is that they have had, in their first edition, the idea that, uh, that you can't separate physics from computation. And all the other textbooks are basically 19th century. Exactly. So he created uh, something called V Python, which I don't know if any of you have heard of yet. And it has a huge user community uh, that is a vis adds visuals to Python. And they created a bunch of uh, language on top of it, which they use for these physics simulations, which are really simple. You know, I'll show you some of these simulations. Uh, but when he saw what we were doing with WebGL, he said, you know, you don't have to recompile things, you don't have to do anything. I'm going to convert years of work into doing, uh, doing it all with WebGL. So he created something called GlowScript, which will run any B Python program. Let me show you these examples. Here's this example programs. And if you look at the code, it's really, really simple, simple code. And it goes along with their freshman physics book. And this has all been converted over in WebGL. They have some wonderful examples over there. So if you just look up glowscript.org on, uh, on your uh, phone. This is, these are my buddies in Santa Fe that have a company that comes out of the Santa Fe complex. Uh, and they do a lot of agent-based modeling. I've gotten really into doing equivalent to solving partial differential equations. It's really neat. They have a thing they've created called agent script, which is uh, basically, any of you use NetLogo? We use NetLogo a lot with our, with our high school kids and getting it in. And they have a version now written in JavaScript that will do everything, pretty much everything in NetLogo called agent script. And let me run one of their Well, that, that's one of them. Anyhow, uh, I'm looking for this big ant module, which we do a lot of. But these things are, are, we're running some of these with hundreds of thousands of particles in them. All have different behavior, uh, run just fine in, in, in WebGL, and so we're busy switching a whole bunch of stuff we do over to that. Let me see if I can more of these. Let's So I'm telling people we have this in our super effort. If you own the sixth edition, <laughs> don't do it. Do it. Uh, the interest is just enormous in it, in it right now. And, and it's, really, it's really interesting to see what's going on. Uh, you know, my buddy Dave Schreiner is my co-author. He uh, just went to Apple. So I'll probably never see him again. They're a very secret place. Uh, Patrick Cozy and Pan. Courses with in the summers. Stephen Garrett Owen of Densmore, there are a company called Redfish. If you want to see some really neat simulations, just look at redfish.com on this. I made a deal with them. They, they wanted to learn graphics, and I wanted to learn how to web stuff. So I taught a class, and they taught me about the web, and, um, and I taught them a little graphics. It's been great for everybody. So let me stop here. I have a lot of other things I can show. Yeah.
Yeah. My research is uh, involved with um, not graphics, but using the web and HTML to accomplish some other things. Yeah. Some of the concerns I've encountered when I've discussed it, <coughs> maybe present paper or whatever, <coughs> is that <coughs> a lot of people are concerned that the browser community can't be held in the forever. Uh, that some features may or may not be supported, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if I'm getting the impression what you're doing is filtering out those questionable uh, uh, differences and co covering it with JavaScript? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I've always tried to stick with, with, with standardized software precisely for those reasons. And OpenGL always had that for me, and so WebGL. The browser world is just weird, and and there's there's great stuff on there, and people who work in that people who work in that world just don't seem to mind. I mean, it's a hacker world, you know. I can see why my academic friends get get really upset and want to have anything to do with it. I think there may be some middle ground in that in that the, the newer the new version of JavaScript that's going to come out is going to be what is it, ES6. I think. Uh, is is supposed to be much more like a, an acceptable computer language so that will help. But a lot of the other browser stuff, I suspect there's going to be some convergence. One of the things I see from the from what's going on with the, at least the graphics people is, is when the the, the 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 standards committees that operate on Kronos uh, took on this WebGL you know, thing, I think nobody understood of those people, because they had come up through the desktop of the GMO world, really understood web issues. And they didn't understand the security issues. And they're having, so one of the things that's happening, or not happening, is that WebGL isn't advancing very fast in capabilities, not because it's not possible, because they're still so hung up on the security issues. You know, at one point, um, Microsoft said, WebGL is dangerous technology. We're not going to have anything to do with it. We don't want it. And they just now released it for, for, in Explorer 11. So I think there's eventually going to be some sort of, of convergence on, on some of these issues. But yeah, I mean, that community out there, in both the good and the bad sense, is a hacker community. I, I tried to, uh, one of the things I was going to do is because I really didn't want to develop a whole library for this thing, and I started using 3JS, which, which people love, and I try to just say, well, I'll pull the math functions out of 3JS. No documentation. The, whoever was doing them would just decide one day to change it. And I said, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, so I went and we developed this, this package. So there's still a lot of that out there. There's still, uh, I think it's going to take a while to settle down. But I think it's clear the advantages of having things run in the browser are so amazing that I think like HTML is pretty stable, WebGL is pretty stable. It's all these other packages that are one person hacking away for weeks at a time that are not stable. And, and that's, that's a problem. Yeah, I just threw up my hands and decided I was going to rely on jQuery. So, yep. And then, and then but I see, see, that's a. a but I don't know how many people are out there supporting jQuery. jQuery is one of the better ones, and, and lots of people like to use that. You can you can kind of force it support, but I mean, yeah, yeah. Knowing yeah. yeah. what you know now, how would, would there have been a different way that you would approach the writing your books, your book, over time? That's part of the question. The second part is about software. But Boy, nobody ever asked me that. Uh, I, every time I look at it, I, every time you do a new edition, you're always caught between how much do you just throw out and write from scratch and how much do you try and patch. And I'd say I probably try to patch a little too much. There's stuff in there now when I look at it, I go, you know, this, is, this isn't that important anymore. I really should have more on this or more on that. But well, that's probably kind of, kind of normal. I mean, I, I, you know, because I look back at the first edition, I go, boy, they're, they're, 
it's just changed, changed so much. But yeah, and, and also I find that uh, what people teach just still varies all over the place. You know, and that, that's the thing my editor is always is always saying. You know, that, uh, you know, if you do this, this, and that, then you're going to lose this guy. And they know where the big where the big buyers are. So so if you want to write a textbook, you do want people to use it. So so there's there's some of that in there. But I don't know. That. There, there are a few things that change. Yeah. What was the other question? Uh, about software, the software that you've developed over the years and how it gets lost. How, because it changes. Yeah. How, 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 for your career book, for your, yeah. how did you do that on your own? Did you have students that helped you? How did you do that? No, I'm, I'm not good at that. I, 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 Dave, my co-author now, and I took on in the last edition, uh, uh, he's one of the few people who, I can work with and he can work with me and we have a lot of trust, but, but generally I, I just want to be sure that things are going to happen and I need them to happen. So I've always done a lot of my own, which means a lot of work. That's okay. So, writing books is a, it's a weird business. Data structures. What about intro to programming? You think JavaScript's a better choice than Java or C plus plus or some of these other classes? That's too? a that's another very interesting question because uh, I'm on the outside now, so I can go sort of argue anything to my colleagues. <laughs> I I think oh no, actually the, the best source of this is my editor at at, uh, at, at um, Pearson, which is Addison Wesley. They sell they're the biggest I think in, in basic computer science. CS1 and CS2. So whenever I see my editor, I ask him, well, what's the trend in languages for CS1, CS2, data structures? And the answer seems to be, no one knows what the hell's going on. <laughs> and, and I think I, at this point, I would probably, if myself, given the interdisciplinary nature of our program, is I might do what you guys do, start with Python. That's what you do. I, I might do that. Uh, but nothing seems right anymore. But what I can't understand is it doesn't seem to me that JavaScript's any worse than any of the others. And it, it's, you know, you just pick one and, and, you, and you sort of live with it. Uh, uh, I, but there, there doesn't seem to be any trend that, that the, the, the bigger computer science education community is deciding this is the way to go. And it's certainly not JavaScript. There, it seems there is exactly one CS1 JavaScript book. And I heard that was not a very good book. Just, you know, badly written. Good. So it's certainly not a trend. 
if anything's a trend, I would say it's probably, it's probably Python. But, you know, I, I'm sort of language neutral at this point. At this point. I just, but, you know, I look at all the stuff our students do, like when they get to be juniors and seniors and they're doing, they're doing uh, pro big projects involving other people's software engineering projects. What are they doing? They're all web-based. They're all developing things for the web. And, uh, uh, so why not JavaScript? The, the other side is all of the students that are eventually going to work in, say, a, a Boeing or in one of the, the big game companies where they develop game engines, they're still, all of those guys basically seem still locked into C++. But if you ask them, because they're developing millions of lines of but if you ask them about it, they always seem to say, well, we don't like the language, but we just don't have anything else that we like better. So I, I, I can't give a good answer. Yeah. More like theory. You, you could see that what all of you should do for the banking industry, CSC plus plus is the kind of the, for the gaming industry. Yeah. The stock. Yeah. <coughs> actually, and, and then things come back, actually, this is, this is irrelevant or kind of funny, is the way, the way our system works, is the, the university has this thing when you want to start a new course, you have to give up an old course because the state has this thing that's going to cost us more money. So we, we kept this COBOL course on the books, even though we didn't teach it for like 15 years. And then Y2K came along, and people were calling up saying, when are you offering the COBOL course? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. The the 491, that's an undergraduate, correct? Uh, or is that a, a graduate? Yeah, what, what we have is a, if it's a special topics, okay. we have they, we have a system where if it's a 400 number, they can get graduate credit, except the special topics. So uh -huh. for special topics, we all have to offer two sections, okay. and it's the same course. So what would you say, I mean, you've been teaching this for a long time, for a student to be successful in one of these courses, what do you think that they, you know, would need a firm grip on? What do you think would be, you know, some of the things that would allow them to, you know, really learn the, the content and the material and to... Well, the problem I have, we discussed a little bit, and I, and I discussed, had this discussion in Clemson, and I had this discussion with other people who use it, is that I think for the, for the students might kill me, uh, is that, that our students have become incredible hackers and assemblers of code, but they lost interest in the mathematics. And, and the thing with computer graphics is that it's got such wonderful underlying mathematics that is the thing that interested me, in, and, and, and the students don't want to do that. Anymore. They just want to program applications, and, and, and they do wonderful applications, things I could I couldn't do so. I don't know how you get back, or whether you should. If, if there's, if you're in a university that basically has one sort of standard computer graphics course, you're not trying to, like Utah, pour out or Stanford, pour out lots of people that are focused on computer graphics. If you're just teaching one or two courses, is it, you know, for me, I want to get the math back in, but I, I don't know if that's really the thing that. That's going to matter to them, or matter to them if they get jobs in, in the industry. But I miss that. I, mean, I miss teaching that part. I sort of always feel a little disappointed that, that for the most part, the students don't care about it. Yeah. I kind of saw that. It was, you know, just say, just do this. Yeah. You know, the order of the multiplication is this. Yeah. You know, and don't do anything other. Well, what a lot of us have stopped doing is is giving tests. It used to be that well, we had these programming assignments, and then. And then we would also give quizzes and sometimes final that would cover the math. But I think a lot of us just gave up the, the fight and just said, oh, well, we're just going to give <laughs> up these programs. And, and you know, the programs are wonderful. The, 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 the students spend lots and lots of time and get really into it. They develop beautiful applications. But the problem is they really don't understand the math, which will hit them when they get into industry. Yeah, I could add to that my, my nephew uh, retired at 33 and worked for a lot of the game, gaming people. And now he's, but they keep sucking him back in. Uh, Oculus is tired. Uh -huh. Which then they got absorbed by uh, Google. Somebody from 
the most absorbed thing. But anyway, he, his strength was mathematics. Um, he was he got started by doing acoustic stuff because of his mathematical skills. Yeah. And he was not a programmer, he was a mathematician. Well, once he learned to become a mathematician, he essentially was a programmer. Yeah. And I think you have to have a partition of students who are focused on that and it's hard to it's hard to cover the whole gamut. So yeah. that you know that and that's getting to be that's just a rare uh, uh, focus of anybody, whether they're in computer or, or physics yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know. Just and, and, and one thing is that the, the whole field has expanded so much that, uh, that I, I made a comment that the cigarette presentation we did for the educators, uh, we had like 100 educators at our session uh, in, at cigarette last summer. And I sort of, at the end, said something about, oh, well, I think you need two courses, and one course would be the sort of basic ge geometric approach to you know, the standard curriculum. Put a whole separate course in GPU stuff because the stuff that I haven't shown you at all, uh, which we can do just on GPU program. But see that. But even when I thought about that afterwards, I said, "Well, hey, where'd the math go? I didn't talk about it in either of these courses. There's just so much more out there that you can do now." And I, I know we started talking about trying to make a game curriculum, and we started teaching one interdisciplinary game course that we shared, and we realized at the end of it that no, we needed four courses before the students could really, really do a good job on a, on a serious, serious game. And that's, that was going for nothing. So there's a lot out there to do. Yeah. You and I talked briefly about the School of Computational Science. Is that what you said in Wisconsin? Or the School of Computation, I think. I think so. The School of Computation. But you know, like if I came around today, Back 30 years ago when I got into this room and further back, I probably wouldn't get into computer science. I'd go to your friend's computational physics, and I'd probably all fired up about that, because that's the kind of stuff that yeah. really hooked me. Yeah. And I sort of uh, lament the fact, or I look, I look at the fact that uh, it'd be nice to get things like computational physics and other computational elements back sort of together, what it means a school of computational science or whatever. But, but I see the, yeah. you know, I see what the physics people are doing, and they're sort of doing it on their own, and it's great. They should be fired up about it. But in some sense, I, I don't want to lose it in the computer science department, right? Yeah. I don't, yeah. Want, to, I don't want to lose that. And I want to make it a territorial thing, which unfortunately these departments tend to make you, yeah. and put you in these silos or whatever. But I, I sort of was tickled by this idea you said about a school of computation in some sense, which might. Reunite in some sense all of these ideas yeah. again. It, it's 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 really tough because I, I work with like three or four different communities. One of them is I work with supercomputing people at, at, at Los Alamos and Sandia, and my view of them, which I uh, uh, managed to piss off a lot about, is that I think their view of computing is is, is so many years out of date. But they have this way of doing things, and and they're going to keep propagating that way. So it's, you know, I think what they could be doing in computational physics is often not what they are doing. And it, especially if you're in the national labs, you just get to pour a lot of money into doing things the whole way instead of doing. It. So it's just it's just weird out there. I, you know, one of the things I think is great triumph. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues is now head of uh, computer science at Oak Ridge. And they're the lead, the lead institution on, on designing all of these future the, the pentascale machine. And, then, and I had told him years ago, I, when he was still on our faculty, I said, you know, you want to pay attention to these, uh, to these GPUs. They're really fast. You know, in a year or two, uh, uh, Microsoft will catch up. And then my, so the big thing is they did the big machine at one time was like, Number two in the world at Los Alamos. They took they converted all the CPUs to GPUs. And, and the only thing they use the CPUs for is to control the GPUs. And I, you know, I ran into him at a, at a conference and I said, Barney, uh, remember what I told you about that? And he admitted I was right. He's the first <laughs> one to admit that. But boy, it's 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 just hard to yeah. you know what the hell's going on. And now I, I hear from the graphics community, they don't know what's going on post, you know, because a lot of it is 
this whole issue about low power, and you, 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 so you can't put any, you can't put any more, you can put more processors on the chip, but you can't put other stuff. So what does that mean in terms of what processors will look like in the future? And everybody's trying to figure that out. <coughs> I think that's it. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, thank you all. Well, thank you.